the Modesto building on Garfield Avenue South, South Minneapolis. This is where just about every employee of Orpok Chocopas lived at one time or another. Um, at the beginning of each month, there would be at least one burnt up mag, uh, burnt up mattress that had been thrown away and outside of the building. And uh, I attempted to get an apartment here. The fellows who was renting the place, his name was Jerry, and they did have no vacancies at the Modesto. So a friend of mine and I ended up getting our lodgings. At 2541 Garfield Avenue South, Minneapolis, Minnesota, which I uh, later on immortalized in song with the song 2541, which uh, did okay for me. Now that was the first post that was release. The, the first, well actually the first post Husker release was uh, um, Myself, uh, Tim Piotrowski, Mary Jane Mansfield, a group that we called the Yano Mamos, which was out on New Alliance Records um, about five months after the band had broken up, after Who's Could Do had broken up. Now, I was involved with recording the Intolerance album at the time, and Tim and Jane, who I'd known for a long time, they came over to the studio and we were just making some noise and we had a ghetto blaster and we thought what what would be more ironic than recording at this great place with the with the ghetto blaster so we made a uh, stereo cassette recording of our first jams together and decided well this is the very best we're ever going to be so we had that mastered designed the record cover that very night and within a week we shipped it off to be pressed by New Alliance Records. And then, uh, now tell us more about 2541 now. When was the song originally written? The song 2541 was originally written right before the uh, New Day Rising album was uh, recorded so that would put it somewhere about 1984 or so. Now, did you bring it in as a Husker song? I brought it in as a Husker song. Um, I forget the actual events, how they went down, but uh, the, the person in charge of the songs that we played was uh, not in favor of the songs. A lot of people, when it came out, thought it was about the breakup of the Huskers. Well, it was reapplied. The, the, the headquarters of Husker Du was one, two, three, four, five, six blocks down at 2541 Nicollet Avenue. Mm -hmm. It too had big windows, faced the same direction, of course. And uh, it was a nice, uh, I'm glad we hadn't recorded it earlier because I had that, you know, that rapier in my golf bag to take out later. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so if the song, obviously, for people who think the song was written about the boosters, what was, to me, the song was always sort of a breakup love story. It's a breakup love song. Okay. And I was, you know, it's the events as spoken in the song exactly as they transpired. I, everything was ready to go. I was just waiting for the van to come to load the stuff down. I didn't have a case for the guitar, so while I was pacing around the apartment, I picked up the guitar and compose the song. Now, it's one of it's one of the rare times where there are two very different versions of it. The acoustic okay. version on the, the single and the RDP. Right. And the, uh, what was the reason to? Um, well, through the magic of studio technology, uh, that's actually the same version, but one of them um, favoring the electric guitar and the drums, okay. and the other one with the more aggressive vocal. Um, I was told once it sounded like Neil Diamond, and I've always, uh, I've always had a warm spot for that compliment. That's not a bad. No, not, not bad. at all. It really um, but yeah, it's the it's the same basic backing track. The other one, you know, 
started out with uh, Martin acoustic guitar. Mm -hmm. The other one started out with you know, electric guitar, solid body electric guitar. But uh, they they both served their purpose. One of the one of the reasons for that nonsense was SST was forwarding the payment for the studio and it was not like clockwork, it was more like clock and not much work. Fortunately, there is still the equipment out there that I prefer to work with. Um, <clears throat> when digital recording first became popular, where it was, you know, where it looked like it was going to take over analog recording, which is using the two inch tape on a 24 inch machine. 16, you can use, you know, one inch. There's one inch eight machines. There's a whole variety of different machines. There's three track quarter inch. There's two track half inch. I mean, there's, you know, everything has been tried. But uh, when it came to digital, um, the first thing that people did to adjust the sound that was coming was they would buy analog equipment to to play the digital mixes through to make it more palatable sounding, to make to warm it up was how people referred to it. Um, so that tells me that most people weren't initially like blown out of the water by the digital process. But then you have the younger people coming into it and the technical technological revolution that's taken place in this country where you know, digital storage is what everybody seems to want. Now, um, I've always found, you know, particularly the sound of cymbals, the sound of pianos, the human voice, violins, electric guitars, I've found the digital representation of those to be not as pleasing as analog. And I've chosen to continue to work with the two-inch magnetic tape when I could have been <coughs> doing, you know, a week's work in a day, you know. Now the, the, the challenge of working digitally and with some of the trademark systems for working di digitally is you can always add another track. You are never faced with having to organize what you're doing in any way other than like I can do this, I can do this, I can do this, I can shift it over, I can make the 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 pitch of the vocal, you know, one hundred percent accurate with, with this machine and uh you know it's it's become so gear driven and uh with the constant availability of another track people have forgotten how to limit themselves to a, you know, a mixable record. Did you ever record any of your stuff digitally? I recorded Intolerance <coughs> digitally. I had uh, started out recording that, uh, thinking it was going to be an analog record. I was, uh, I was in one of those positions where the studio had been paid anyway. They had multiple rooms. I got you know, screwed out of the room that I wanted to use. And so I did that one, uh, you know, digitally as an experiment. It wasn't, uh, wasn't Pro Tools, it wasn't straight onto a hard drive, but uh, it was onto uh, magnetic tape. It was a system in transition. I have found it to be less satisfying. Um, I went back and a couple years ago I remastered that record analog, but I will always wish that it had been, you know, that I would have waited to do it in a completely analog environment. But 
I, I gave it a chance. I can say that my prejudices have been tested and, you know, I maintain them. This is Bare Ass Beach, known also as Hidden Beach, um, Cedar Beach, although across, the, across Cedar Lake there is the official Cedar Beach. This was, a, uh, uh, this was an unofficial swimming grounds for years. South Minneapolis, a lot of people from South Minneapolis and uptown would come here for, you know, get away from the more populous beaches. Um, Calhoun would get a little bit uh, perfumey with the uh, suntan lotion and such. And this, this was more of the the pre-anarchy beach. It, uh, uh, especially from this point on, there would be a lot more like nudity and you know like people humping under the trees and all sorts of things it wasn't an official beach as I say and so it wasn't policed uh, every once in a while like maybe a couple times a year uh, some authorities would come down here but uh, it, it took a lot a lot back then but uh, uh, started getting too popular and, you know, the, the least responsible people started coming here and, you know, just making a mess of things and just overwhelmed the, the people that were, you know, keeping it neat and, you know, the, the trash removal was the the responsibility of the people that came here. He's like, if you brought something down here, you carried it out of here. And, you know, it just became a, a litter dump and, you know, piles of empties and broken glass where, you know, the next afternoon, you know, mothers would be bringing their kids. And, you know, so, uh, I, I pretty much stopped coming here in the, uh, in the late 80s. But I was here so often that uh, I was inspired for the cover of New Day Rising. Um, it's, it's summer now, mid-late summer, and this would be the time of year that I would be spending, you know, after dinner into the evening times here. And I always liked the sunset that we're beginning to see maybe seen a little bit too much of, or, but uh, that inspired me for a, you know, a visual for the New Day Rising cover, even though it's, you know, a, you know, sunset, and it's, the title is New Day Rising, I thought that it was, uh, you know, people don't have to know what direction the sun is moving in order, you know, it's a still photo. And to further, you know, confuse matters, I printed the anything above the horizon in negative, and so that's why you have a a bright black sun in a white orange sky, rather than you know traditional colors. And was that just a couple of dogs that happened to be in the water? It was a couple of dogs that just, you know, were. We're trying to get back to the Rossmore building. <laughs> okay. Um, wait, what, what is the uh, Kokono? Kokono. Kokono. Well, it's interesting that you should mention Kokono now. Kokono is close to Skopje, Macedonia. Beautiful, beautiful country. And I was heading towards Skopje when I noticed a sign that said, 
megalithic observatory 60 miles. And when we got to the club in Kokono, I mentioned it to promoter, guy who's now a close friend of mine, and I said, what's this observatory that I saw on a sign? And he said, well, you see that man sitting over there at the coffee shop? That's the man who discovered Kokono Observatory. This fellow was uh, familiar with Angkor Wat and Abu Simbel and Stonehenge and how the different Aubrey holes and different points and plinths and dolmens were set up to you know make not only a solar but a lunar calendar and he had noticed that some of these traits were present at this place where he had done a lot of camping and he went and did some measurements and he had them checked out by NASA which approved Kokono, verified it as one of the true one of the four megalithic observatories on Earth. Now, I was heading in the other direction on that trip and was not able to go to Kokono, and plus there was no significant astronomical event taking place so that it would be of any significance to be there. Now, it was getting to uh, mid-February and my mother was lingering not improving and they had had the palliative conference where the family gets together and decides what level of care she's supposed to be given you know what the what the family is going to you know give them the permission to do and she's lingering and lingering and I'd already made movements to cancel the beginning of the tour because you know there's there's only one mother there's only a million tours there's you know the sun rises at a sp significant place every day you know somewhere around the world and the niches that are carved in the surface of the earth by man you know shrink in significance when it comes to the last time you can spend with your mother and the 26th <clears throat> the 26th of February I was called to uh, come to the hospital because she was she was losing her life and took care of everything that had to be done after that and made it to Croatia where I was put in prison on my 50th birthday awaiting trial for uh, bringing merchandise across the border that was not properly declared and there was considerable amount of merchandise at stake and you know I was already in jail so I might as well go to court the next day the day after my uh, 50th birthday and for the first time ever, the impounded merchandise, I mean, seriously, for the first time ever at this Croatian border, merchandise was returned to somebody. I had really given a good, good spiel to the, to the judge. I had worked it out with the translator beforehand. So now I've got two days to get to Kokino, play a show in Prague, and then we're on our way. We're going to go see the sunrise between these two, two, two nicks in a mountain. And we get there the night before, and the next morning, uh, the the day before, we were going to go to the mountain for the sunrise. We arrived a day early, but the clouds began to gather, and the weather worsened. And after all of this. The fellow that was pointed out to me at the, as the discoverer of Kokono, not even he bothered going up to the observatory because there was no chance that there was going to be any observations made. And so I thought that was a, uh, 
a rather tedious story to to relate. And that's why I chose it for you today. <laughs> but there's kind of there's kind of a lesson there. Um, you know the the burning of the house. You know I'm 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 five days after the house burnt, I caught the the second of the two cats and you know in introduced him into an apartment lifestyle and you know I'm thinking well you know the only stuff I lost is stuff that can burn and you know I took that a bit further and I was thinking you know well you know if it can burn it really doesn't matter all that much and as I was returning from the crematorium with my mother's ashes, it kind of rang true again to me because there was a imper impermanence to the physical body and everything that was really worth saving about my mother, which would be the memories and you know thoughts of good times and the love. It it remained. It was imperishable. Oh, uh, never spoke to him, but uh, uh, I've been in the same room and, you know, very bodily close to him. Uh, Husker Du was looking at the Paisley Park studio at one time, and he came out from a dance rehearsal, and, you know, there was a lounge where we were talking, and, you know, he entered the lounge, and, but uh, he was always at First Avenue with, you know, tremendously huge bodyguards. And uh, do you know if he ever saw one of your shows? Or? I doubt if he ever saw one of our shows, but uh, I've always uh, I've always thought that there was a similarity to the Warehouse Record Covenant. Co I've always thought there was a similarity between the warehouse record cover and um, I forget which album of his, but uh, he's standing underneath a sign that says Arcade and it's a double album. We would have had the first Warner Brothers double album since 1999 and they held Warehouse back so that Prince's double could come out the same day. And uh, at one time... Uh, sign of the Times. Was it Sign of the Times? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I, I don't know for certain. But uh, they, uh, Wendy and Lisa came to Creation Audio uh, when it was Nicollet Studios, when Paul Stark was, was running the place. And they were going to do a remix of You Need Another Lover. And Wendy forgot her bass, which I thought, well, if she needed a bass, why didn't she bring it? But, uh, you know, I, I know what that's like. You get, get an idea and, you know, you, you satisfy your curiosity the most direct way you can. But uh, I happen to have uh, Fender Precision Bass in my office, which is now immortalized on the uh, the remix of "You Need Another Lover." So, Minneapolis in that period. <laughs> Can I ash? <laughs> Eighty-four, eighty-five. You guys are, are breaking big. Your replacements are breaking big. When Prince is breaking you, did it seem sort of like? Eighty-four and eighty-five. He was already, you know, what year was Purple Rain? Did it seem like, though, that like Minneapolis just was exploding? Or? It seemed like a bunch of people were coming from out of town, um, roosting in our hen house, kind of. Um, within a few years, it actually became kind of kind of obnoxious because there was so 
you know, they weren't bringing their venues with them. These, you know, and you know, a lot of them are, you know, wonderful people that helped us help the scene, you know, become even greater. But it seemed at the time like, you know, they were interlopers, and all of a sudden, you know, there were fewer gigs to play because. There was a greater saturation of bands, and uh, um, this is, you know, kind of after the scene, you know, it's like after uh, after Husker Du had broken up, it, you know, still had this this crowding kind of, and it uh, it wasn't our precious little Klondike Nugget anymore. It was, you know. It was, it was our pie, but the the world was, you know, picking the fruit from it. Good thing or bad thing? Oh, if it uh, if it was good for music, which you know, I don't know. Was it? I'd have to look at another city to really answer that question. Was it a good thing for Seattle? Was it a good thing for Athens? Um, I suppose any community that gets attention, you know, it, it's a positive thing. How about in terms, I mean, in terms of, did it make it more difficult to have national attention on the city? Or, uh, you know, national music attention, musical attention? Well, what happened is we went from having no attention and people saying, uh, you know, oh, it's Mary Tyler Moore Town, or, you know, to like, oh, the replacements in Husker Du are from there, or isn't Prince from there? And the trouble when that kind of thing happens to a town like Minneapolis and St. Paul is the people that haven't spent very much time there have a preconceived idea of what the city is. And I remember comparing the the attitude that I saw early in uh, Los Angeles. It it seemed like you know let, let's pull out the winter scenery, you know let's put a punky beat behind it, you know it's like okay this is Minneapolis and uh, we should not skip over the importance of. Steve Greenberg and the song Funky Town. Funky Town, I think, is still the biggest hit to have come out of Minneapolis. I think so. Okay. What year was this? Uh, Funky Town? What year was Funky Town? 78? 79. Right around in there, yeah. Because it was, uh, you know, it, it was parodied and covered by by bands really early, and uh, uh, Greenberg is just a wonderful guy. You know, he's, he's the guy that, you know, actively brought people into music and, you know, was, um, you know, helping people in the studio. You know, he, I wouldn't exactly call him a philanthropist, but he, he spent his money courageously. I'm, I'm sure he's fishing somewhere or, you know. No. I think he's doing okay. I, Were there other hits besides that? Um, they, they kept trying. Now, Punky Town was originally pressed on a very small, very small label. Um, Lips Inc. was the title that they gave it, and I don't think the mem the the core of the people on the record ever performed together. I think some of them played on the record, and that was it. I'm probably mistaken, but uh, it it seems to me that it was in that era where people were called in to do a session. You know, here's what I'm hearing, and from what I've heard uh, Greenberg say, it was like fully formed in his mind you know, before he started shaping it musically.
the effect that a Christogal can have on your life, you really have to go back to what the people are giving high praise to and look for the human errors. Look for the places where if you would have put 10 minutes more into it, you would have come up with a better line for this spot or this spot. Um, you cannot be you cannot be mystified. You cannot take part in your own mystique. You've got to you've got to know when your work has been substandard to your standards. Um, it's very helpful when you're struggling to write the perfect verse. It's very good to go back to something off of one of the highly acclaimed records and read something that, you know, is terrible because that will let you know that, well, you can get by with a little. You know, it's like, you know, perfection, perfection is not a mortal quality. I wasn't writing as many hardcore songs. So in the beginning, I found it. I found it very unsatisfying, and you know, I was willing to play them. Just couldn't write them. You know, the only thing I could come up with in that idiom was, uh, "What do I want? What'll make me happy?" And that's the story of a guy trying to write a hardcore song. You know, he had a uh, he had a quantity thing that was kind of different from the way that I was trying to work. I, to this day, I cannot, I can rarely write a song from the beginning to the end and be satisfied with the result. I am, I am Ginsburg to Bob's Kerouac. You know, it's like I edit like a worried fiend. Are, are, are there many any songs you can think of that you've written that just like man it just came together half an hour you had a song oh or? green eyes I mean I was I had that song a hundred percent written during the during the interval of walking over to the Parpisa organ and by the time I stepped away from it there was a song a hundred percent. Um, the arrangement, the words, the chorus, the introduction. Um, another song like that is uh, going to be on the argument, uh, a song called, uh, probably will be called So Far From Heaven. The, uh, the refrain is, what's, what's a little angel doing so far from heaven? But uh, that's, that's a little bit of a mouthful. So I think So Far From Heaven will suffice. Another one of these songs where I was like, write down the idea that you have. Then you read it back and you go, wow, that's an entire song. That's all I need. And uh, Any songs dragged out for years? Songs that have dragged out for years usually remain dragging. There are, uh, um, usually they, they linger and they age as chord progressions or chord changes that I might have a melody that contrasts with them that I really want to put into, you know, you know, want it to be actualized as a song. Um, a lot of times I will write a version of a song and need one verse and then write another version of the song 
and another time I will be inspired and I'll write another version of the song and it comes together because I've edited parts of those three attempts into it. Um, there are songs where I have written 50 verses in order to be satisfied with three and uh, you know, that can be frustrating. There is no surety that it's ever going to work. And you're thinking, you know, it's like, okay, back to the salt mine that doesn't have any salt. But you keep going there because, you know, you know there has been salt there before. The activist, the, the musical adventurer was replaced by the hipster, the, the person that, you know, it's mostly important to be able to prove they were somewhere rather than to like quietly think about what the experience was. And people are more wrapped up in documenting what they saw than experiencing it. It's, it's kind of gotten better, but when, when you first start seeing the technology on the market, you know, a show, a live show would be, you know, like a porcupine with these quills of cameras sticking out above the, the body of the crowd. And, you know, it's like people became afraid to say, I don't know let's go see. Instead, it was like, uh, oh yeah, you'll dig them. You know, or like, you know, oh, I read about them on so-and-so's blog or, you know, there is a strong possibility that times as they have changed have moved beyond my comfort zone. I, I see people, you know, on the streets of Brooklyn who are wearing, say, a short sleeve plaid shirt that is too tight for them, and they have a real unstyled beard. And I look at that and I think, okay, punks wore long sleeves, so this guy's wearing short sleeves. You know, just everything has to be you know, is based on the opposite of what the American punks or the American alternative people did um, so that they so that they can claim a newness or something. Um, I mean, amongst the hipsters and, you know, the actual aficionado is you know, they, they, they blend in with the hipsters and, you know, they, you never know if the person you talk to is, you know, just a well-informed idiot or somebody that actually is speaking from experience. I was in, uh, uh, I was in Hollywood. There was a concert given by the band um, Yehovah 13. I was talking to this young man on the sidewalk afterwards and he was talking about music and bands that he liked and it was as if he was you know reciting it from some list you know that he got on Google you know Google hipster and you find what I listen to Who else has influenced you? Mm. Brian Wilson, in a uh, in a less direct way, but uh, Brian would get a lesser roar 
but still a roar out of voices that uh, other people have gotten with guitars. You know, just a, a spread of sound, you know, making a chord, making a power chord, but with voices rather than guitar strings and pickups. Um, big influence has been uh, musicals, um, film soundtracks from the 30s. I was I was in love with Ruby Keeler from the age of 10 until the age of 13 or so. But, uh, you know, Gold Diggers in 1933, 35, 37, the movie 42nd Street, the song 42nd Street has nice, beautiful, you know, minor key blues lilt to it that just the greatest hook I've ever heard. Um, the Who, there's another another good roar um, punctuated so well with with drums um, you know various various friends and acquaintances but uh, um, most formative listening pro process has probably been the 27 cent per record cutout bin or the uh, um, the oldie station, uh, I sought out the the roots of rock and roll um, before the punk thing. Um, I would go to the roller disco on oldies night or back to the 50s night. Um, in the mid-70s, early to mid-70s, the... Uh, Oh, you had Sha Na Na, you had uh, um, Flash Cadillac and the Continental Kids. I think that these back to the 50s groups and the phenomenon um, kind of gave people a bit of what they were looking for and found with punk rock where it was a rejection of, you know, self-indulging, you know, the other stuff out there. Um, there was so much crap on the radio in the early, mid-70s. And, uh, you know, somebody doing an Eddie Cochran song or a Gene Vincent song or you know, Runaway, Del Shannon, any of that had had more feeling in it than much of what was coming out at the time. And Didn't really get to meet her, got to, um, got to be in the presence of you know, it was it was almost like being an audience member. I mean, very professional and everything, but uh, she had this, you know, unwritten rule, or maybe it was written somewhere, that she did not want us to see the guests or talk to the guests until they were introduced onto the show. And I can see where that would be nice and spontaneous. Um, when we first pulled in there, we we're pulling into the parking area and there's these big studio doors, you know, huge garage doors. And I see little bits of like broken off sticks and pieces of leaves and stuff that had been sprayed with day glow paint. And I'm thinking, okay they have recreated or tried to recreate the artwork from the album cover. And so I just said, oh, we're, you know, they went all out. They're in, 
they're ready for us. And I believe they had a little plexiglass box that the drums went in. Uh, that was kind of the the trend at the time, was to like totally isolate and, you know, I, I, I think there was probably pretty good sound on there. But we didn't realize it at the time, but it was a scripted interview without us having seen the script before. And that was kind of an early exposure to what the... <laughs> Never gets the call. Hello, Chris. It's going well. We're here. Yeah. Okie doke. Looking forward. All righty. Bye bye. It's our landlord. Um, the. When we started doing the interview, it was kind of like already too familiar. I mean, they, you could tell that she had read some kind of sheet, you know, like questions to ask. Well, I mean, she had the script sitting in front of her on the desk and um, it was not necessarily an enhanced professionalism, but a safety net. You know, it's like they they want to be able to control the interview. They want to make sure that there's no, you know, you know, I I believe it was Hulk Hogan who like lifted her off the ground and walked around with her or something like that. And uh, um, I was I was kidded you know, for years after that, because when she comes up to me, I just gave her a hug. And, you know, she was this little old lady that, you know, okay, I'll give you a hug. And it's not like she shied away or anything like that, ran screaming to the sidelines. and He tried to hug me! But uh, the questions, at, at one point, it was like, uh, Bob, I hear you're the, you know, the grounded, more business-like, you know, the, the tucked-in fellow, and, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, or, you know, it's like, here's the guy from Land Speed Record, you know, like, you know, he's the mild-mannered one. It's like I, I couldn't see any of us as being the mild-mannered one. I mean, we were Husker fucking do, and... Then after him, it's like me, and it's like, and we hear you're the wild one. I mean, you're the, you know, you're the one that we have to look out for. It's like we have to, we have to make sure that, you know, the, the seven second button is, you know, at the ready. Or I'm not going there, but uh, you know. And I just said, well, you know. I don't know how I answered it, but you know, if, if if that's what if that's what this show is, if that's what the script is, you know, it's like, you know, it's your show. And then, you know, Greg, how would you describe yourself? Well, I'm not wild, and I'm not tucked in. You know, so I guess I'm the guy in the middle. And I had wanted to talk about the work that we were doing with Jarno and. Joan had, as I recall, she had done some significant public addressing of the AIDS plague at the time. I mean, it was, you know, it was like four years after the disease had been diagnosed. In, you know, that it went from being the mystery gay cancer. Um, and I wanted to challenge her and the other members of the band that it's like, okay, would would everybody involved in this show give what they earn from this program towards the journal benefit, you know? And I'm thinking, well, you know, for me it might be, you know, 
with the show tonight. It might be a couple thousand with, uh, with Joan Rivers. She's probably going to miss it less. Um, but it was a scripted interview, and it was like, you know, over before, before it really started. The basic difference between Minneapolis and St. Paul at, you know, at the genesis was pretty much simple prejudice. Minneapolis had the Walker Arts Center, had the, you know, you know, had the money, the, the newer money, the more money. Um, it had skyscrapers taller than 19 stories. It had a you know, national network television show based there. It, um, it had just built the indoor football stadium and, you know, so it wasn't Omaha. It couldn't be compared to Omaha. You know, please don't compare Minneapolis to Omaha. Whatever you do, we'll build it, we'll buy it, you know. Meanwhile, St. Paul's just kind of like laying down in the background, kind of Kind of Baltimore-y, kind of Kansas City. It's definitely a river town. More of a river town than Minneapolis really seems. Minneapolis, they use the, the river not for transportation, but for as a means of power to run the mills and, um, you know, mill the grain and then that's shipped out for railroads. You know, it's in many ways, St. Paul is the last eastern city. Minneapolis is the first western city. As far as the North is concerned, it's definitely true. But uh, St. Paul had this, because the downtown was not much going on there, it, it just, you know, people had to go to Minneapolis to, to be entertained in a, you know, sophisticated way. I mean, St. Paul at the time, um, one of the first two cities to um, pass anti-gay legislation um, with the city council, um, Anita Bryant days, um, but also a one of the first places where that became a battleground and uh, where it became an issue, you know, ahead of its time. You know, so it's like, okay, did it draw attention because it was uncool or because it was cool? Well, there was conflict there, so it got attention. And, you know, myself coming from South St. Paul, I needed to know my way about St. Paul and Minneapolis. If you're from St. Paul, you know your way around St. Paul and Minneapolis, but you don't know South St. Paul, you have no reason to go there. If you're from Minneapolis, unless you're going to McAllister or First National Bank or the state capitol, you might as well stay in Minneapolis because there's really nothing that St. Paul will have to offer. How is the creative process for you different from when you're creating music to creating art? When I'm creating art, there is a longer interval between when I when I start doing the piece and when I totally reject the direction and you know destroy what I've done so far. Whereas uh, with lyrics, you know, you write them in the notebook. You know, I'm, I'm the kind of lyricist that, you know, I'll, I'll write 50 verses to when I need five so that I have more to select from because there's, you, you're rarely satisfied 
that you have like really said what you've gone out to say and that you've really captured with words the the grandeur or whatever that you are trying to accommodate with mere words um, those multiple verses end up staying in the notebook sometime later they'll be you know I will have never written the perfect version of the song and so I grab bits from here bits from here uh, because like commercial art there is a production schedule no matter how much of a fine artist you want to be um, it's not important how many works that you start it's how many works that you finish and if, a, if an idea is worth doing at all it's worth doing poorly and I say that because if it's such a good idea maybe settling for 95 percent isn't that big of a compromise. Uh, you've got to let your brain do your thinking. You cannot let the contents of your brain do your thinking for you. It's uh, There is an element of uh, there is no word that suits other than magic that can be very useful to the right practitioner. I have often resorted to uh, book magic for ideas and it rarely fails where you pick any book. Any book is an encyclopedia. Any book is a lexicon. Um, you might not want like NASCAR for dummies, you know, but you know the the usually the better the book, the the better you're going to get out of it. But during uh, the some of the composition of the argument, I would take an old, you know, cherished copy of Paradise Lost by John Milton and. I would take that in my left hand and take a dagger in the other hand and insert it into the book at random. And as I open the book with my eyes shut, you know, point the pointard into the into the book and look at the word that it stops upon and you know, think in terms of that word, what does that word bring to the idea? Does it conform? Does it give you a whole different look at things? Um, rarely is it totally inappropriate. But quite often you think it's appropriate and then you end up using it later on anyway. The, uh, the unconscious mind is usually right you know, in the, uh, in the decisions that it makes. It's just that all decisions have to be consciously acted upon. I mean, you can be like blacked out drunk and like, you know, run over somebody and not remember it afterwards, but um, that's not songwriting. Hello, got something for you. <laughs> Don't see any roses named after like poor soul musicians or anything like that. No. <laughs> now, what is the significance of this place? This is the second time I've been here in my life. The first time was for about 15 minutes for a photo shoot, which was used on the back of Warehouse Songs and Stories.
the baby song, now, despite what people could easily be led to believe, um, beyond the music, there were other reasons why I chose to spend as much time as I did with Mr. Mold, is uh, the sense of humor. The, the, the two of us could laugh like crazy and uh, you know, just, just goofy shit sometimes. And we had been joking about Barry White and, uh, hello, baby, I love you, baby, you know. And I came in for a vocal and the vibraphone was set up and there was also a metal slide whistle somewhat close. And I just said, hello, baby. And then like played like this Gerber. And, uh, you know, sounding like it was actually performed by, you know, one month old babies. And uh, we were rolling on the floor laughing about it. And then uh, Felgy, the, the engineer, and Bob, you know, why don't you, why don't you go in there and do that again and we'll roll tape? So I kind of improvised a structure to it. It ended up being a refreshment break on the, on the record. You know, it served some purpose on there. Despite later accusations, I never came up with the idea of recording it for the record. I never fought to have my great composition, the baby song, included on the record. I thought, well, this might be a nice lead-in to Flexible Flyer because Flexible Flyer is like this life song. Okay, I'd like to give you a quick demonstration of a style of collage work that I probably didn't originate, but I don't see anybody else doing quite what I do with collage. I had felt for a long time that collage was they were used imagery as a substitute language where somebody would very carefully cut out the picture of a clock and then carefully cut out a picture of a daisy and then a nuclear power plant cooling tower and that they would make a statement with collage and it was, you know, an, an easy, easy thing to teach grade school kids and you know really anybody to to do because it's just you know basically playing with paper dolls but I had sought a way to blend two visual images and also to incorporate an element of chance and let the picture themselves define what they were going to be, what part was going to see, be seen. Now, for example, this two on this clock has a 50% likelihood of being seen in the finished collage. Now, we'll see what happens. Now I take one image and moving it along erratically but with some deliberate technique I will make irregular strips that sometimes at their best look like geography or look like parts from a map or a, uh, a photograph of a landscape, landscape is seen from above. And 
Yeah. Since you're making, since I'm making strips, they usually look like isthmuses between an island and the mainland, or you know, river deltas, or some form of land. That's uh, how I've grown to think of them. But we'll keep this one kind of simple for demonstration purposes. So we've got five pieces going from that image. And although random, although randomly chosen, um, I also kind of like the contrast of a uh, failed attempt at a homemade flying machine with the uh, clocks. And so I will do more of the same using this image. And I'm not going to get too precise or too overboard with the technique and I am wishing to keep this at the level of a demonstration. I'm not evangelizing this technique of collage because then other people would be doing it and they would have time to do it better than me and it would no longer be my own thing but since this, documentary, since this documentary is about me, I get to do my own thing. And, uh, you know, it, feel free to try your hand on it. Try your hand at it. Just don't, just don't try to sell them. That's all I want to say. And we'll leave that one as is. Now comes the integration of the images where with a weaving technique I go positive and negative and uh, one second while I get a glue stick And this is the dirtiest, filthiest, cat hairiest glue stick I could find. Now, this is the hard part because fingers are usually bigger than paper. Um, sometimes a tool helps. At one time I uh, put sewing needles on the ends of guitar picks to make little surrogate fingers that could pick up the paper a little easier than my clumsy fingers. Okay, so we tack things down because we want to we want them to stay in place. Why bother putting them in place if they're not going to stay in place? Now, we went over, so now we go under. And, you know, sometimes the paper is oh so fragile and does not like to be handled very much. And sometimes you have problems because you forgot to glue one piece or another. So we'll get that one resituated first. And let me state that a little glue stick goes a long way. That it's far better to use too little than to use too much. And you just kind of sidle it up into position. Sometimes you have to, to help a little bit, but 
by gluing them down it makes a continually stiffer matrix Well, it looks like the number two has already been obliterated, so it exists only on the sub-level, the subconscious of the piece. And sometimes there's just little tiny corners that overlap just like that and this is a situation where the sewing needles come in real handy but it starts getting a whole lot faster right around here where you don't have to tack the tack the whole thing down but make sure that the ends are secure Now sometimes you can spend hours on a really intricate matrix of paper and the finished imagery is just a bunch of mixed up crazy nonsense that is unattractive. But this one looks like we might get a satisfying result from this. check the angles and it's unavoidable that you're going to have little bubbles here and there and things that don't turn out quite as perfect but in the real situation you would be able to take the time to do it again more accurately or just do it slower from the get-go as I say this is a demonstration but even a demonstration is it's possible to get a serviceable piece of art as the final result um, we have a concept. The concept is uh, using essentially the roll of the dice, or flipping of the coin, to determine the composition. There is some amount of deliberate, I mean, I get to choose what geography it mimics and but it's over and under over and under final piece usually 
locks the whole thing together. But uh, it is easier with homemade tools. It's easier when you're not moving as fast as I have. But that's how I make a collage. What would I title that? I would title that $250. Um, pretty much we've obliterated the, you know, you can't tell what the underlying image is, uh, the, the black and white thing, but uh, that's okay. It's, it's not our fault. It's the odds. But, uh, I like how you'll get just little pieces. But, uh, there we go. You know, it was a, a rite of hardcore conformity to adopt a symbol for, you know, all, all your fans that couldn't read your name. You know, if they, they would see that symbol on your poster and, you know. I, I see no other reason for it when it comes down. It serves no purpose other than, like, fashion. Could punks have been, like, you know, fashion conscious? Fuck yeah. Um, a band, the ring, a band with one train of thought, rather, uh, rather inflexible, I would say, and three interjoined horizontals, you know, united with that train of thought. For those who can't read. Now, for those who could, there was you the, the you had the logo the, that went on forever. The written logo, yeah. How, second it, poster, second poster ever made. Uh, the from, the logo from appeared. The, a poster yeah. for uh, a, a gig. Yep, I had to. Uh, I I had taken an example of the word that was too light to burn onto the plate, and so in the last moment, I colored it in with a sharpie, mm -hmm. and it had been ripped. But I colored it in with a sharpie as quick as I could, and um, when I, when I'm doing something like that, I'll do the very beginning and then I'll do the very end, and I'll meet in the middle so that it doesn't look like it degenerates. Mm -hmm. You know, you're getting faster as you know. You see that with handwriting. If somebody's just jotting down a quick right. note, they get quicker and quicker and more legible as time goes on. And that's the only attention that I paid to it as far as like designing that logo. It just so it, conformed it, to the vacuum. It wasn't like inspired by the Psycho poster or anything? Or? No, no, no. Okay. Um, or Green Day. <laughs> Wait, Green Day came before. Or Motley Crue. <laughs> <laughs> now I, I've not engaged in, but I've been witness to arguments about the umlauts in Motley and in Husker, but I don't know who's on who's on first with that chicken and egg. The loss of the record shop is a real tragedy because the there was a place that people could go and just absorb culture without, you know, you could pretend you're looking through a rack of cheap records, but you could be assimilating everything that's going around you. You can, like, see somebody that, you know, it's like, hey, he dresses like my friends and I dress. 
you know it's like what is he listening to you know and of course that's that was valid in say 78 79 when any punk you saw was probably somebody that you knew but uh, and then you have that toned down peer pressure that is connected to music and you know taste and what is within the confines of like something you listen to once laugh at and throw it away or something that is like genuine and eternal and is going to be played and cherished for the rest of your life you know and uh, when I think of some of the records that I may have picked up right around the time that I bought Modern Dance by Perubu. Modern Dance being a record that I hope I hear it frequently for the rest of my life. Um, and, and think of how, by comparison, unsatisfying and unfulfilling some of those other records were. And, you know, it's just, you know, it, it's nice that the cream rises to the top. You know, in uh, you know, what would be the glass, though? What would be the uh, what would be the milk? The milk is the uh, the stuff you listen to once and you know put back in the rack. In your, uh, you travel a lot with Whisker with Novomob by yourself. Yeah. When, when you're in a place you've never been before, are are back then were the record shops something you would seek out as I would seek out record shops I would seek out drum shops I would uh, I would get up early and uh, you know back then you were dependent upon the yellow pages to you know find the different drum shops in a town uh, usually the the record stores were finding you they were coming to the gig and saying like hi we're you know, so and so from you know, crushed mentality records, and we'd like to, uh, you know, have you drop in the store and you know maybe sign some things, blah blah blah. And if you've got time, and if you are uh, not traveling with label people who have something much important, much more important for you to do, then you uh, then you accommodate that into your life. Uh, reminds me of one of the inconveniences of Warner life is they would team us up with a pair of people in this case it was two women that traveled wherever we were traveling and on the sur on the surface it looked like they were making you know life easier for us you know it's like uh, Oh, do you need a cup of coffee, boo-boo? One of them actually called me boo-boo. And uh, I'd never called her. And uh, then we find out that, you know, they've been contacting promoters to make sure that the opening bands were, you know, what they wanted them to be. And, you know, they were interfering with you know, who was warming up for us and like, oh, so-and-so might be a hardcore band, and, you know, we're, we're working on trying to, you know, disassociate them from that. Now, regardless of where we were at with the evolution of our sound, the bands that we chose to work with, that, that was our decision, that was that was part of our self-expression that was like, you know, see what else you can listen to, you know, it was like not locking the doors and forcing people to listen to it or anything, but like um, maybe compensating for the risk taking that we were moving away from, but uh, you know, it was nothing of their business. They, they had no. They should have had no involvement with the, the live production of, of the music. And 
you know? And that's also when you start getting into, you know, your friends and, you know, in some cases your family being manipulated by people that call you boo-boo. You know, it's like, hey, go, I'm not your boo-boo anymore. Oh man, growing up, I uh, I was very, very uh, clumsy as a kid, and at seven years of age, I was in traction, and I was watching television, and what I later found to be a day at the races came on TV, and the scene where traffic is I diverted onto the racetrack itself. And I am like in the hospital just laughing my butt off and just like a white light experience that words were something that you could toss around and <clears throat> had, you know, the, I knew they had different meanings, but the fact that they could be used in such a fun way was a, a revelation to me and uh, you know, it had an effect on the rest of my life. Night at the Opera, even though it tries to be everything to everybody, I, I think it's still pretty masterful. Um, horse Feathers, fine, but uh, Duck Soup has got to be the strongest concentration of it's like a perfect yeah um, even they're worse though like uh, at the circus room service night at Casablanca fine totally fine movies it's just that when you when you hold them up next to you know the Paramount stuff mm -hmm. it's you know, just the uh, The facility that, you know, it's like, there's no, there's no style of thinking that arrives at those puns, you know, or, I mean, it's, it's almost like a certain kind of brain doing a certain kind of thinking. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm, you know, I wouldn't say very dyslexic because I'd have no way of knowing. But uh, I think dyslexia plays a big part in that ability. I had put together from the Reader's Guide to uh, Periodical Literature an entire press kit of everything written about the Marx Brothers in the United States um, that was available in the University of Minnesota Library. And it was a stack of photocopies, you know, four inches thick. And of all the things that have slipped through my fingers, you know, I really wish that I had still had that because there was some great stuff in there that I haven't seen reprinted elsewhere. I didn't realize how anti-Semitic Minnesota really was until... Um, you know, professing this, you know, love and interest for the Marx Brothers. Really? Yeah. Wow. It, uh, um, yeah. It, so we're, we're talking... Uh, we're talking like junior high school, so like, uh, studies, you know, the studies. minister is concerned, you know, too much interest in the Jewish comedians and... You know, and, you know, my, my mother and father were placed in the community in such a way as, like, anything happening at the school, they were going to hear about it first and, you know, this, that, and the other thing.
Come on in. Let me uh, let me show you around my place here. Uh, these are the front steps here. This is uh, right here is where I've written quite a few of my songs. I'm sitting out here on the stoop and take you through the front door here. This tree was planted probably 1930 or so. The first people that owned the house, the, the Hale family, which were uh, close relatives of my grandfather, so that's how the family was connected to the property. And come in here, mind the steps. This is the hallway. This picture here was done by Herbert Hunky, and I actually traded a Burroughs print for it. It uh, was one of the few pieces by Hunky in private collector's hands. I, he wasn't much of a visual artist. You got a nice French door here. Coming into here, this is the living room. Going off into the dining room here. That table has been in the house for about 80 years. Um, my mother's grandfather clock, and uh, here's my Hammond organ, where uh, it's the same Hammond that was on Candy Apple Gray, uh, sorry somehow. And Come around here, we'll show you some other instruments here. I got my timpani and uh, my PA speakers and got a couple Leslie's here for the Hammond organ. And there's another Hammond over there, but here we have uh, my drums. I got, uh, I built this kit up one piece at a time. It's some 1937 Slingerland Radio Kings to start with. And uh, that's my favorite, favorite drums to play of all the drums I've ever owned. And got my Farfisa, other PA speaker. Here's one of my favorite parts of the whole house here is this fireplace here. It's a brick kind of, uh, kind of arts and crafts looking with a really nice oak mantelpiece. And uh, there's my dad when he just got out of the service. There's my mom and dad on their wedding day. And here's a picture of my son, Carl who's now in his uh, late 20s. Come around here, this is, uh, this is the dining room. This is the dining room table that I pointed out a couple minutes ago. This is where I do my collage. I cut up magazines over here and um, then I assemble the pieces over here with a white background and adjust them. And uh, I think I'll be showing you how I do that a little, a little later. Right here we got book cabinet, as you can see, filed in order, over a hundred different boroughs, first editions, inscribed and signed, and this is a portrait of my mother that was done by Jerry Ryan, a St. Paul pastel artist. Um, my dad traded an outboard motor for this picture uh, back in uh, late 60s or so. And coming in here. It's my bedroom. There's Bozo, there's Snowball. They'll probably, they'll probably go into the bathroom or go hide somewhere. But here's a, another book cabinet. These are like my favorite personal reading and such. There's the bed going off this way into the bathroom. And let's see if Mother's around, just a second. Are you here, Mom? Well, I guess she stepped out for a while here, but I'll show you the kitchen. Believe me, I'm going to get to this mess sooner or later. Now, it's the stove, here's the dishwasher, the sink. And coming down in here, we have the sunken family room. And the back door where I built a ramp for my mother so she can get to the, she can get to the car a little bit easier. But uh, I'll take you through the side of the family room back into the living room here. Right upstairs here is uh, where I store a bunch of papers. You know, there's a full upstairs there with an attic and just boxes and boxes of posters and, you know, a bunch of stuff that needs to be sorted through. And uh, let's see, we'll take out the front door again. And uh, thank you for letting me share my house with you.
All right. We are at a um, friend of mine's studio space at uh, White Bear Avenue and Interstate Highway 94, uh, the studio of my friend Chris Larson, who is kind enough to make the space available for the stuff that I moved out of my crispy house. Um, because of the, the suddenness of the departure of the goods from the in, inside of the house, it uh, didn't get all sorted through yet. Only the, only the stuff that was like decided to be thrown away long time ago got the dumpster the first day. So there's a lot of this that's got to be sorted through and picked through, but uh, um, got some windshields here. I got a couple windshields from my Studebaker, which are very hard to find, not really, but even uh, even the stuff that wasn't burned got heavily smoked out. And I'm glad that it didn't get, I'm glad that it didn't get hot because this is tempered glass and it would have not been good. And let's see, here's the, what's left of the, some of the flag collection. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, this one, this one was actually the only thing that survived another fire at a lumber company. I drove by the day after the fire and it had been hanging on a post outside the building, hanging from a wooden flagpole. And when the building burnt down, it burnt through the flagpole and this landed on the, the ground and didn't get burned up. So. This, this flag has escaped being burned twice. And this is where I keep my Buzzcock videos. And those will probably be gotten rid of because there's, I've gone DVD. Oh, here's a piece of artwork made by my godfather, Jeff Petrich. And it got a little smoky as well, but uh, some things it's impossible to part with. I forget the name of the artist that did these, but there's a little story to go with it. Um, he left one... Uh, do you know who this guy's name is? He, very popular in New York. His name just escapes me, and it's, but uh, everyone else will know. All the viewers will know. But he gave one of these to a friend of mine to give to me, and he hadn't looked at the original picture very, very carefully because he omitted the figure that was supposed to represent me, and word got back to him that I was like, Huh, some kind of gift you sent me. I was probably being sarcastic about it. And so he sent me five of these. Um, here's the second one, which I wrapped up to send to somebody but before the fire. I'm not going to go through every single box. But, uh, no, no, but just any, anything you think... No, I was just yeah. talking to the camera. <laughs> this is between me and the camera. Um, here's something I did that, that didn't get burned, but there's nothing to say that it might not still get burned. I uh, want you all to come and see my band Nova Mob at Berkeley Square. Uh, doors open at 9 o'clock. I've got, or let's say I've had boxes full of that sort of stuff all through my life. Um, 
drumsticks. I use Vic Firth. Um, this is an example of what happens to glass when it's suddenly very hot. But uh, it might have also gotten hurt while being moved. Ah, another box of posters. That one's kind of interesting. You can check that one out later. Um, original attempts at making a uh, cover for a record, which became hot wax. British flag that didn't get burned. Various and sundry. Was the flight like in yours? Yeah, I've... Uh, I've always sought flags, but uh, I've always preferred stealing them. Um, not for any love of tradition, but it does kind of, uh, you know, it, it's representative of con conquest. And uh, um, I used to have a huge McDonald's flag that uh, I, I moved or something, lost that, but uh, hotel flags, state flags, um, I've even bought flags if I've been so inclined. Um, it's nice to dra drape a flag over your amplifier if you're playing someplace out of out of state, out of town, out of country. It makes people think that you've got an appreciation for them, which I usually do. Um, more envelopes full of posters. These, these Husker Du posters just get in the way. I wish I knew something that I could do with them. Um, some of my books on Marcel Duchamp. Um, nowhere near all of them. What the hell is that? Oh, that's a book cover that I made for something. Forget a lot of things that you, that you do sometime. Oh, Octavio Paz. Um, but yeah, this is... Marcel's drawer. Um, also, Edward Mybridge, who arguably contributed to the formulation of some of Marcel's ideas. I, ideals, ideas, ideas. My father's slide projector. Ah. Uh, Box full of crystal items. Suitcases full of collage materials. Drum rims. Wing windows for a 62 Studebaker. Um, to be used. A really old saw. A window from some church on the east side of St. Paul. This is uh, uh, certainly not the first thing I ever stole in my life, but as we were uh, vacating the church, I took that as a souvenir. Um, I noticed the other day that there were quite a few of the original windows still in place. Uh, I think this one was out of repair when uh, when I grabbed it, so no real crime was committed. Uh, books and things. Drums and things, lots of drums. What you seen the back up here with your tubes? That is a Leslie Tone cabinet that came with the, the black Hammond over there. 
that's made by Leslie, but it doesn't uh, doesn't wobble around like the well-known versions do. My made in Bulgaria winter overcoat. Um, this has been in the family for years. I'm sure many of you know what that is for. This is where, if you had no indoor plumbing, plumbing this is where my mother's people would place their night soil to be uh, thrown away later. Um, pieces of wool to buff with. The uh, tons of drums. What bass drums? Which different sets? Oh, of uh, well, these two match the kit that I have at home. Uh, uh, they're Slingerland Radio Kings, which is the the drums that I, you know, came to prefer after playing similar drums for years, but Slingerland Radio Kings are particularly known for the quality of their snare drums. They would take one piece of maple, a uh, quarter inch thick, and bend it into a complete hoop. Under much pressure and much steam, but under the drum head, there is more Radio Kings and some bongos and a mysterious box. Ooh, that sounded cool. Sounded like a symbol. Indeed. This symbol was purchased by my brother when he bought the first drum set he ever owned. Is that your drum set? Uh, his drum set and my first drum set uh, one and the same reside at the Minnesota History Center. Um, this is cute. This is my grandpa and grandma. And my grandpa's driver's license. That's Fred Augustine and Nora Cargus, who married each other in 1922 and gave birth to my mother two years later. More drums, more drums, more bags full of savings. There's Santa Claus. Now, here's a good fire story. This is the cover to upright base where my cat Bozo took shelter during the fire. And, you know, this, this was loose on the body of the base anyway, but uh, he hid in here. Um, not fireproof, but that's where we found him and he was, at least he was pretty clean. Uh, Big Daddy Roth, who was a well-known, you know, automobile cultural figure in, uh, up until his death about 10 years ago or so. Uh, my friend Tom Hazelmeyer gave me that piece of art. Um, that is half of a portrait of William Burroughs that I did a long time ago. That is the bottom half. And here's a couple others, and uh, here's, a, here's a picture that Shepard Ferry gave me. And he's famous. And there's a big sloppy painting. And we got here a selection of cattle prods. Uh, this would be used to encourage the cows to, actually steers, to get along little doggy um, into the 
uh, the killing floor from the from the stockyards themselves. More crap. This is mostly papers and posters and things that will be relatively disposable when the time comes, but stuff that if you don't have the time, you, you grab everything and sort through it later and decide if, if you really have to keep it or not. We were writing our songs like any regular album and I don't know where it first started being thrown around. I mean, who brought it up or what inspired it, but we noticed that there was a kind of a theme of a young person going through the initiations of adulthood. And we adjusted things to conform to that. We eliminated things that couldn't conform to that. We were inspired by the idea of having a concept to... We were inspired by the appearance of this concept to exaggerate the concept and to make it even more concepty. And uh, there are things that, you know, we were fairly naive about. I mean, I, I think everybody waking up and it was a dream, you know, it's convenient plot device, you know. You, it's easy to write yourself out of any corner if you wake up and it's a dream. Does that, does that explain the final track? Well, it's titled Recurring Dreams, but also the, uh, um, it could be that that track is a fast forwarding throughout, through the rest of the events of a person's life. And then the, the long tone is like an EKG flatlining. And then, you know, that too is unplugged and stopped. Um, I've always looked at it as the, the second one, that it's like the entire life after 17 played out in a jam song.